This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Keisner's The Enchanted April by Elizabeth von Arnim Chapter 3 The owner of the medieval castle was an Englishman, a Mr. Briggs, who was in London at the moment, and wrote that it had beds enough for eight people, exclusive of servants, three sitting-rooms, battlements, dungeons, and electric light. The rent was sixty pounds for the month, the servants' wages were extra, and he wanted references. He wanted assurances that the second half of his rent would be paid, the first half being paid in advance, and he wanted assurances of respectability from a solicitor or doctor or clergyman. He was very polite in his letter, explaining that his desire for references was what was usual and should be regarded as a mere formality. Mrs. Arbuthnot and Mrs. Wilkins had not thought of references, and they had not dreamed a rent could be so high. In their minds had floated sums like three guineas a week, or less, seeing that the place was small and old. Sixty pounds for a single month. It staggered them. Before Mrs. Arbuthnot's eyes rose up boots, endless vistas, all the stout boots that sixty pounds would buy. And besides the rent, there would be the servants' wages, and the food, and the railway journeys out and home. While as for references, these did indeed seem a stumbling block. It did seem impossible to give any without making their plan more public than they had intended. They had both, even Mrs. Arbuthnot, lured for once away from perfect candor by the realization of the great saving of trouble and criticism an imperfect explanation would produce. They had both thought it would be a good plan to give out, each to her own circle, their circles being luckily distinct, that each was going to stay with a friend who had a house in Italy. It would be true as far as it went. Mrs. Wilkins asserted that it would be quite true, but Mrs. Harbuthnot thought it wouldn't be quite. And it was the only way, Mrs. Wilkins said, to keep Mellersh even approximately quiet. To spend any of her money just on the mere getting to Italy would cause an indignation. What he would say if he knew she was renting part of a medieval castle on her own account, Mrs. Wilkins preferred not to think. It would take him days to say it all, and this, although it was her very own money, and not a penny of it had ever been his. But I expect, she said, your husband is just the same. I expect all husbands are alike in the long run. Mrs. Arbuthnot said nothing, because her reason for not wanting Frederick to know was the exactly opposite one. Frederick would be only too pleased for her to go. He would not mind it in the very least. Indeed, he would hail such a manifestation of self-indulgence and worldliness with an amusement that would hurt, and urge her to have a good time and not to hurry home with a crushing detachment. Far better, she thought, to be missed by Mellersh than to be sped by Frederick. To be missed, to be needed from whatever motive, was, she thought, better than the complete loneliness of not being missed or needed at all. She therefore said nothing, and allowed Mrs. Wilkins to leap at her conclusions unchecked. But they did, both of them, for a whole day 
feel that the only thing to be done was to renounce the medieval castle, and it was in arriving at this bitter decision that they really realized how acute had been their longing for it. Then, Mrs. Arbuthnot, whose mind was trained in the finding of ways out of difficulties, found a way out of the reference difficulty. And simultaneously, Mrs. Wilkins had a vision revealing to her how to reduce the rent. Mrs. Arbuthnot's plan was simple and completely successful. She took the whole of the rent in person to the owner, drawing it out of her savings bank. Again, she looked furtive and apologetic, as if the clerk must know the money was wanted for purposes of self-indulgence. And, going up with the six ten-pound notes in her handbag to the address near the Brompton Oratory where the owner lived, presented them to him, waiving her right to pay only half. And when he saw her, and her parted hair, and soft dark eyes and sober apparel, and heard her grave voice, he told her not to bother about writing round for those references. "'It'll be all right,' he said, scribbling a receipt for the rent. "'Do sit down, won't you? Nasty day, isn't it? "'You'll find the old castle has lots of sunshine, whatever else it hasn't got. "'Husband going?' Mrs. Arbuthnot, unused to anything but candor, looked troubled at this question, and began to murmur inarticulately, and the owner at once concluded that she was a widow. A war one, of course, for other widows were old, and that he had been a fool not to guess it. Oh, I'm sorry, he said, turning red right up to his fair hair. I didn't mean... Hmm... Hmm. Hmm. He ran his eye over the receipt he had written. Yes, I think that's all right, he said, getting up and giving it to her. Now, he added, taking the six notes she held out and smiling, for Mrs. Arbuthnot was agreeable to look at. I'm richer, and you are happier. I've got money, and you've got... San Salvatore. I wonder God is best. I think you know, said Mrs. Arbuthnot with her sweet smile. He laughed and opened the door for her. It was a pity the interview was over. He would have liked to ask her to lunch with him. She made him think of his mother, of his nurse, of all things kind and comforting, besides having the attraction of not being his mother or his nurse. I hope you'll like the old place, he said, holding her hand a minute at the door. The very feel of her hand, even through its glove, was reassuring. It was the sort of hand, he thought, that children would like to hold in the dark. In April, you know, it's simply a mass of flowers. And then there's the sea. You must wear white. You'll fit in very well. There's several portraits of you there. <laughs> portraits? Madonna's, you know. There's one on the stairs really exactly like you. Mrs. Arbuthnot smiled and said goodbye and thanked him. Without the least trouble and at once, she had got him placed in his proper category. He was an artist and of an effervescent temperament. She shook hands and left, and he wished she hadn't. After she was gone, he supposed that he ought to have asked for those references, if only because she would think him so unbusinesslike not to. But he could as soon have insisted on references from a saint in a nimbus as from that grave, sweet lady. Rose Arbuthnot. Her letter making the appointment lay on the table pretty name. That difficulty then was overcome. But there still remained the other one, the really 
annihilating effect of the expense on the nest eggs, and especially on Mrs. Wilkins, which was in size, compared with Mrs. Arbuthnot's, as the egg of the plover to that of the duck. And this, in its turn, was overcome by the vision vouchsafed to Mrs. Wilkins, revealing to her the steps to be taken for its overcoming. Having got San Salvatore, the beautiful, the religious name fascinated them. They, in their turn, would advertise in the agony column of the Times, and would inquire after two more ladies of similar desires to their own to join them and share the expenses. At once, the strain of the nest eggs would be reduced from half to a quarter. Mrs. Wilkins was prepared to fling her entire egg into the adventure, but she realized that if it were to cost even sixpence over her ninety pounds, her position would be terrible. Imagine going to Merlurs and saying, I owe. It would be awful enough if some day circumstances forced her to say, I have no nest egg. But at least she would be supported in such a case by the knowledge that the egg had been her own. She therefore, though prepared to fling her last penny into the adventure, was not prepared to fling into it a single farthing that was not demonstrably her own, and she felt that if her share of the rent was reduced to fifteen pounds only, she would have a safe margin for the other expenses. Also, they might economize very much on food, gather olives off their own trees and eat them, for instance, and perhaps catch fish. Of course, as they pointed out to each other, they could reduce the rent to an almost negligible sum by increasing the number of sharers. They could have six more ladies instead of two, if they wanted to, seeing that there were eight beds. But, Supposing the eight beds were distributed in couples in four rooms, it would not be altogether what they wanted to find themselves shut up at night with a stranger. Besides, they thought that perhaps having so many would not be quite so peaceful. After all, they were going to San Salvatore for peace and rest and joy, and six more ladies, especially if they got into one's bedroom, might a little interfere with that. However, there seemed to be only two ladies in England at that moment who had any wish to join them, for they had only two answers to their advertisement. Well, we only want two, said Mrs. Wilkins, quickly recovering, for she had imagined a great rush. I think a choice would have been a good thing, said Mrs. Arbuthnot. You mean, because then we needn't have had Lady Caroline Dester. I didn't say that, gently protested Mrs. Arbuthnot. We needn't have her, said Mrs. Wilkins. Just one more person would help us a great deal with the rent. We're not obliged to have two. But why should we not have her? She seems really quite what we want. Yes, she does from her letter, said Mrs. Wilkins doubtfully. She felt she would be terribly shy of Lady Caroline. Incredible as it may seem, seeing how they get into everything, Mrs. Wilkins had never come across any members of the aristocracy. They interviewed Lady Caroline, and they interviewed the other applicant, a Mrs. Fisher. Lady Caroline came to the club in Shaftesbury Avenue, and appeared to be wholly taken up by one great longing, a longing to get away from everybody she had ever known. When she saw the club, and Mrs. Arbuthnot, and Mrs. Wilkins, she was sure that here was exactly what she wanted. She would be in Italy, a place she adored. She would not be in hotels, 
places she loathed. She would not be staying with friends, persons she disliked. And she would be in the company of strangers who would never mention a single person she knew for the simple reason that they had not, could not have, and would not come across them. She asked a few questions about the fourth woman and was satisfied with the answers. Mrs. Fisher of Prince of Wales Terrace, a widow. She too would be unacquainted with any of her friends. Lady Caroline did not even know where Prince of Wales Terrace was. It's in London, said Mrs. Arbuthnot. Is it? said Lady Caroline. It all seemed most restful. Mrs. Fisher was unable to come to the club because, she explained by letter, she could not walk without a stick. Therefore, Mrs. Arbuthnot and Mrs. Wilkins went to her. But if she can't come to the club, how can she go to Italy? wondered Mrs. Wilkins aloud. We shall hear that from her own lips said Mrs. Arbuthnot. From Mrs. Fisher's lips they merely heard, in reply to delicate questioning, that sitting in trains was not walking about, and they knew that already. Except for the stick, however, she appeared to be a most desirable fourth, quiet, educated, elderly. She was much older than they or Lady Caroline. Lady Caroline had informed them she was twenty-eight, but not so old as to have ceased to be active-minded. She was very respectable indeed, and still wore a complete suit of black, though her husband had died, she told them, eleven years before. Her house was full of signed photographs of illustrious Victorian dead, all of whom she said she had known when she was little. Her father had been an eminent critic, and in his house she had seen practically everybody who was anybody in letters and art. Carlyle had scowled at her. Matthew Arnold had held her on his knee. Tennyson had sonorously rallied her on the length of her pigtail. She animatedly showed them the photographs, hung everywhere on her walls, pointing out the signatures with her stick, and she neither gave any information about her own husband nor asked for any about the husbands of her visitors, which was the greatest comfort. Indeed, she seemed to think that they also were widows, for on inquiring who the fourth lady was to be and being told it was a Lady Caroline Dester, she said, Is she a widow too? and on their explaining that she was not, because she had not yet been married, observed with abstracted amiability, all in good time. But Mrs. Fisher's very abstractedness, and she seemed to be absorbed chiefly in the interesting people she used to know, and in their memorial photographs, and quite a good part of the interview was taken up by reminiscent anecdote of Carlyle, Meredith, Matthew Arnold, Tennyson, and a host of others, her very abstractedness was a recommendation. She only asked, she said, to be allowed to sit quiet in the sun and remember. That was all Mrs. Arbuthnot and Mrs. Wilkins asked of their sharers. It was their idea of a perfect sharer that she should sit quiet in the sun and remember rousing herself on Saturday evenings sufficiently to pay her share. Mrs. Fisher was very fond, too, she said, of flowers, and once, when she was spending a weekend with her father at Box Hill— Who lived at Box Hill? interrupted Mrs. Wilkins, who hung on Mrs. Fisher's reminiscences, intensely excited by meeting somebody who had actually been familiar with all that really and truly and undoubtedly great, actually seen them, heard them talking, touched them. Mrs. Fisher looked at her over the top of her glasses, in some surprise. 
Mrs. Wilkins, in her eagerness to tear the heart out quickly of Mrs. Fisher's reminiscences, afraid that at any moment Mrs. Arbuthnot would take her away and she wouldn't have heard half, had already interrupted several times with questions which appeared ignorant to Mrs. Fisher. Meredith, of course, said Mrs. Fisher rather shortly. I remember a particular weekend, she continued. My father often took me, but I always remember this weekend particularly. Did you know Keats? eagerly interrupted Mrs. Wilkins. Mrs. Fisher, after a pause, said with sub-acid reserve that she had been unacquainted with both Keats and Shakespeare. "'Of course! How ridiculous of me!' cried Mrs. Wilkins, flushing scarlet. "'It's because,' she floundered, "'it's because the immortals somehow still seem alive, don't they? "'As if they were here, going to walk into the room in another minute, "'and one forgets they're dead. "'In fact, one knows perfectly well that they're not dead, um, "'not nearly so dead as... "'You and I even now,' she assured Mrs. Fisher, "'who observed her over the top of her glasses. "'I thought I saw Keats the other day,' "'Mrs. Wilkins incoherently proceeded, "'driven on by Mrs. Fisher's look over the top of her glasses. "'In Hampstead, crossing the road in front of that house, "'you know, the house where he lived. "'Mrs. Arbuthnot said they must be going.' Mrs. Fisher did nothing to prevent them. "'I really thought I saw him,' protested Mrs. Wilkins, appealing for belief first to one and then to the other, while waves of color passed over her face. And totally unable to stop because of Mrs. Fisher's glasses and the steady eyes looking at her over their tops. I believe I did see him. He was dressed in a even Mrs. Arbuthnot looked at her now, and in her gentlest voice said they would be late for lunch. It was at this point that Mrs. Fisher asked for references. She had no wish to find herself shut up for four weeks with somebody who saw things. It is true that there were three sitting rooms, besides the garden and the battlements at San Salvatore, so there would be opportunities of withdrawal from Mrs. Wilkins, but it would be disagreeable to Mrs. Fisher, for instance, if Mrs. Wilkins were suddenly to assert that she saw Mr. Fisher. Mr. Fisher was dead. Let him remain so. She had no wish to be told he was walking about the garden. The only reference she really wanted, for she was much too old and firmly seated in her place in the world, for questionable associates to matter to her, was one with regard to Mrs. Wilkins' health. Was her health quite normal? Was she an ordinary, everyday, sensible woman? Mrs. Fisher felt that if she were given even one address, she would be able to find out what she needed. So she asked for references and her visitors appeared to be so much taken aback. Mrs. Wilkins, indeed, was instantly sobered, that she added, It is usual. Mrs. Wilkins found her speech first. But, she said, Aren't we the ones who ought to ask for some from you? And this seemed to Mrs. Arbuthnot, too, the right attitude. Surely it was they who were taking Mrs. Fisher into their party, and not Mrs. Fisher who was taking them into it. For answer, Mrs. Fisher, leaning on her stick, went to the writing table, and in a firm hand wrote down three names and offered them to Mrs. Wilkins. And the names were so respectable, more, they were so momentous, they were so nearly august, that just to read them was enough the President of the Royal Academy, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and the Governor of the Bank of England. Who would dare disturb such personages in their meditations with inquiries as to whether a female friend of theirs was all she should be? 
They had known me since I was little, said Mrs. Fisher. Everybody seemed to have known Mrs. Fisher since or when she was little. I don't think references are nice things at all between, between ordinary decent women, burst out Mrs. Wilkins, made courageous by being, as she felt, at bay. For she very well knew that the only reference she could give without getting into trouble was Shulbred, and she had little confidence in that, as it would be entirely based on Mellersh's fish. We're not business people. We needn't distrust each other. And Mrs. Arbuthnot said, with a dignity that yet was sweet, I'm afraid references do bring an atmosphere into our holiday plan that isn't quite what we want, and I don't think we'll take yours up or give you any ourselves, so that I suppose you won't wish to join us. And she held out her hand in goodbye. Then Mrs. Fisher her gaze diverted to Mrs. Arbuthnot, who inspired trust and liking even in tube officials, thought that she would be idiotic to lose the opportunity of being in Italy in the particular conditions offered, and that she and this calm-browed woman between them would certainly be able to curb the other one when she had her attacks. So she said, taking Mrs. Arbuthnot's offered hand, Very well. I waive references. She waved references. The two, as they walked to the station in Kensington High Street, could not help thinking that this way of putting it was lofty. Even Mrs. Arbuthnot, spendthrift of excuses for lapses, thought Mrs. Fisher might have used other words. And Mrs. Wilkins, by the time she got to the station and the walk and the struggle on the crowded pavement with other people's umbrellas had warmed her blood, actually suggested waving Mrs. Fisher. If there is any waving to be done, do let us be the ones who wave, she said eagerly. But Mrs. Arbuthnot, as usual, held on to Mrs. Wilkins, and presently, having cooled down in the train, Mrs. Wilkins announced that at San Salvatore, Mrs. Fisher would find her level. I see her finding her level there, she said, her eyes very bright. Whereupon Mrs. Arbuthnot, sitting with her quiet hands folded, turned over in her mind how best she could help Mrs. Wilkins not to see quite so much, or at least, if she must see, to see in silence. End of chapter 3